I'm going to say a bit of housekeeping, then I'm going to pass over to Fenton and he's going to introduce today's speakers. Um, for those of you who have been here before, you're not going to hear anything massively different. It's the usual, um, could you check your mobile phones or switch to silence out of respect for our speakers. The, there is no planned fire alarm. Yeah, there's no planned fire alarm, so in the event that one takes place, just follow myself and other members of staff out of the door and we will reassemble on the other side of the uh, ARC apartment block. Prony doesn't hold any parking, so anybody who's turned up in the car, um, I should advise you that the spaces are paying display, and uh, we have we have a landlord who will come. And finally, Prony does host a series of events across the year. Details can be found on the Prony website, and if you want actually uh, more details, we can email you on our distribution list. Um, to do that, just leave your email address on the compliments set. Um, and I'd just like to take to take a second to say, this is a collaborative event. Um, it's held jointly between Prony and very much UHF. We've done most of the organization and that's, something, that's a relationship we, we continue to, to value. So thank you very much. So it's my pleasure to ask Fenton to come, come and introduce the speakers. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for coming out today. We appreciate it. I'm Fintan Mullen, and I'm from the Ulster Historical Foundation. And as Stephen said, uh, the foundation has been involved with Prony in jointly organising this lecture today. Um, we're delighted to have the two speakers with us here, all the way from Chicago, Plainfield and Fountaindale, Chicago. Um, the first speaker up, it's going to be a, uh, a double-hander today. So the first speaker is going to be Deborah. Deborah Dudak. <laughs> Head of Adult and Teen Services at the Fountaindale Public Library in Bolingbrook, Illinois. Uh, Deborah specializes in British genealogy uh, and technology topics. She is currently pursuing a second master's degree in genealogical, paleographic and heraldic studies at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. And her partner in crime here today is going to be doing the second half of the presentation is Tina Beard. And Tina is the genealogy and local history librarian at Plainfield Public Library in Plainfield, Illinois. Tina uses her master's degree in archiving and preservation to lecture on topics, including genealogical research, archival preservation, and Illinois history at national, state, and local conference level. She also has provided professional research assistance for more than a decade and has been researching her family's own history here for over 20 years, which is part of the reason why they're in Ireland at this time. We are delighted to welcome Deborah and Tina to Belfast because they have very kindly hosted the Ulster Historical Foundation during our annual lecture tours in the United States and in 2014 we had a superb evening at Fountaindale Public Library wasn't it um, on the outskirts of Chicago uh, with Deborah and Tina put that event together for us so we are delighted to welcome here I'll not take up any more of your time and pass over to Deborah and the presentation today the title of it is All Routes Led to Chicago Irish Railroad Workers and Canal Builders in the 19th Century. Hello, is everybody, can everyone hear me in the back? There's like two people chilling in the back, not that I'm not judging, but you could move up here a little bit more. Uh, yes, th thank you so much for the lovely, uh, lovely introduction. Thank you all so much for coming out here to listen to us. I know you took a huge risk coming out today to think like, oh my gosh, what are these people going to talk about? How does this, how does this impact my research? In truth, it may or may not. Uh, but it's what Tina and I have found ourselves in as we've been doing our re research here in Ireland, uh, both in Dublin at the National Library's, uh, National Archives of Ireland and the National Library, and then up here in, uh, the, uh, up here in Prony, is that we're sometimes in the same situation a lot of American researchers find ourselves in that you all find yourselves in with a lack of records, can't find the things that you want, having to go to, to different records or different sets or private correspondence or whatever have you to kind of find the things that you want. And we wanted to kind of introduce you to some of the ways that when people have left Ireland, where they're going, what they're doing for a living, how that's impacting uh, our research in America and how they're still coming back here to Ireland. They're still coming back here. I mean, you all see them. It's a lot. It's a lot different from when I was here in Belfast about ten years ago. There really was. There was really great. Everybody was really lovely. They looked at me like I was an alien from a foreign planet because they never saw any Americans. I'm like, oh, what are you doing here? I'm like, oh, I'm here. It's friends. It's great. You know, they looked at me like I was a weirdo. Um, 
y'all still look at me like that, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm going to introduce you all to Irish in the Great Lakes. Everybody knows I, a lot of people from Ireland went to um, Boston and New York and uh, some places in Texas, but the Great Lakes are really, really great. If anybody's been to Chicago, you'll, Tina will talk about the whole Irish uh, connection to Chicago. Uh, but I'm going to introduce you to all of the other places. This is a cradle of settlement in the Great Lakes, and it's it's part of a great uh, a, a great metropolis of of large cities in the Great Lakes, which have big Irish populations, and it and it kind of blows everybody's mind. Everyone thinks, oh, Chicago, the place, blah blah blah. But um, the Great Lakes, which are all here, are all inland lakes, and technically they're big giant oceans. And if you would like me to talk more about that, we can. Um, but there was a lot of movement from the canals by canal builders to get to the lakes that would take them to other places where they could build more canals and then eventually railroads and do more shipping and, and then of course get into alcohol uh, sort of businesses. It all kind of ties together. Um, so as we look at say that there's about 2 million people who are funneling into the United States, there's no firm estimates, but we're seeing a lot, a lot of growth right after our American Civil War um, into a, a, this little cradle of, of settlement. So the Grand Lakes region is very, very misleading. Most people would think, oh, it's Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, but it, it touches in all of these states, which for our, <laughs> our research as, one, as sovereign states under one sovereign nation makes things very, very confusing. If you wanna have a good time and if you wanna brag, come to the United States and tell people how, how easy it is to go to one office to go get all your records and people will just start to weep. They'll just start to cry. Uh, so I'm gonna take you through some of these. Now, Minnesota, and, and we're just gonna go in order of states coming down. Um, the two states of, of in our, our little Great Lakes region, which really did not receive a whole lot of Irish settlers, were Minnesota and Indiana which kind of blows my mind because Minnesota has like one of the largest uh, Irish festivals in August every year where they get thousands of people. I, I don't know if they import Irish people. So if you get any like posters on the wall that say, come to Minnesota for this festival, we need bodies. Just don't go next year. I want to see how many people show up. So, uh, but a lot of the people who are settling in Minnesota and they're coming in there are doing a lot of some shipping work, um, railroad farming, iron ore work. But all of that stuff has to be transported and all that stuff has to be going somewhere. So when our Irish are coming over and they're getting work in the railroads, they're also, uh, they're building those railroads, they're working in the mines, but they're also shipping everything back. Minnesota is our cash cow of uh, one of our cash cows of the Great Lakes because of the mining. And I was talking to a researcher friend of mine who said that uh, there's still pockets in Minnesota, which are entirely uh, communities of Irish miners like nothing has changed. Like they're all there, they all have the same naming scheme. Um, and they said that they're basically don't ever leave. And they somehow have a beef with the people from uh, Germany, are they Lutherans? The people from uh, Lake Wobegon. And they, uh, there's this ongoing little thing, but Minnesota, not a whole lot of them. So, you know, we're, they're primarily miners and building railroads and stuff, but they're having a good time in Minnesota if you don't mind a lot of snow. Um, same thing with Wisconsin, and Wisconsin's more intricate. When you look at things uh, with Wisconsin, you're looking not so much at canal building, but a lot of railroad work and a lot of shipping. So Wisconsin is very, very fortunate to be on two of the Great Lakes, and they have a, a lot of other huge industries. They're doing a lot of uh, farming because it's a big cheese making state. If you hear Wisconsin people call cheese heads, they're doing a lot of uh, they're doing a lot of dairy farming. Um, and they're also doing a lot of brewing and brewery business. All of those have to be shipped. This is one of, uh, this is a major, without having a huge major city like Chicago, they're shipping beer, some of that iron ore, all of those cheese goods, everything out of the state and then down the Mississippi River, which is right here. And that's going all the way down to New Orleans. So a lot of really good places for, the, for Irish uh, immigrants to have come into the country to settle, to make a really, really good life for themselves. Um, there's a really great, uh, the uh, state of Wisconsin also had a really, really great recruitment scheme where they're like, you know, you can work your tail off out here or you can work here, but you won't get nearly as much back as you will come to Wisconsin. I don't know if any of you have been to Wisconsin. There's not much there. All right. 
there we make fun of wisconsin it's beautiful there's a lot of farmland and it's gorgeous but dude there's like nothing there you have to love being around nothing to love wisconsin but but like i said if, if you love to farm if you love you know to do railroad work if you like making beer you like making cheese it's a great place to go they have great cheese you should go it's a fantastic place and it's very you know it's it's surrounded by water on two clays areas now i'm not going to say a whole lot about illinois because i'm going to let tina take the reins on a lot of these um but apart from tina being able to explain to you a lot of the intricacies of the irish huge irish influx that came into illinois um, we had a huge area of, of canal workers who were coming in to work the INM Canal, which was sponsored, which was a, was a um, state sponsored, actually a federally sponsored program to bring um, settlers um, and goods um, from the Erie Canal up into the Great Lakes. Um, it was a massive undertaking. There were a ton of Irish immigrants who came in to work that. Very low wages, really horrible, horrible hours, uh, a lot of deaths. Uh, there's a lot of places that you can still go and, and ride the INM canal in a boat. You can go and you can bike it. You can even see, you know, imitators of uh, impersonators of Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd Lincoln there. Um, but what I love the most about this is there were 14 Irish newspapers in Illinois. Most of them are in Chicago. There's like one in Moline. Is that how Moline? Um, but the rest of them are in Chicago and you have your pick. They have Irish newspapers. Um, asking about uh, people from people from Ireland writing the Irish newspapers in Chicago, asking to know where their relatives are, and that's really really great. And a lot of these um, are either going online in places like Chronicling America, which is a free newspaper website, um, to uh, some of our online databases that are pay sites like uh, newspaperarchive.com and stuff. But if you go through the columns asking for people asking for relatives, that's a really really good place to go. Um, Indiana, again, one of those places that really doesn't have a whole lot of people coming in from Ireland, but there was a lot of canal work. There's a lot of canal building from about 1820 through uh, about uh, 1857, 1858, 1859. And, uh, and Indiana was one of those places that did have um, a group of canals that were being built. And the land was cheap, so people were able to come over here. They were able to make a very good wage, which is very different from the I&M canal situation. Um, in Illinois and in Indiana, people were able to dig for the canals, get really good work, and then they got really super cheap land. And the land in Indiana is great, banging farming going on out there. Um, so when they've got all of that kind of built up, you have a lot of people who are coming into Indianapolis. They owned a whole section of uh, Irish immigrants had a whole section of Indianapolis, and they still continued to have um, Irish immigration well into the 1920s, 1930s. And they had a huge community. People were still coming in. They just did um, a really great oral history project in Indianapolis with one of the parish churches where they had people who had come over during the 20s, 30s, and then right after the war um, to discuss like why they came over, uh, you know, what was their family life like in Ireland. And one gentleman talked about how he had left, uh, his mother had left as a, a young woman, probably about 1900. And he and his mother went back in the 50s, back to Ireland to see where she was born. And, and her, his mother said the house looked virtually the same. There wasn't anything, nothing had really changed. And that uh, the big excitement was uh, that they finally got one of those uh, washing, self-agitating washing machines with a roller on it. And, and his mother's like, we're getting on the plane and we're going back home. She's like, we're, we're going, Indiana had become home at that point. She's like, I got a washer, I got a dryer, I got an oven, we, we got it made, we're, we're staying, you know? Um, but it was really, really lovely. So the Allen County Public Library System, if you guys do get a chance to come to the States, if you're interested in doing um, uh, any sort of research, um, you wanna go to the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne. Um, it is the largest genealogical library east of the Mississippi. I know some people hear about going to Salt Lake City to go out see, hang out with the Mormons, you know, go do the tours, don't drink any of their polygamy beer. I've heard it's horrible, uh, but the, um, it's a really great place to go. And if you're on a website called Internet Archive, I highly advocate that you, you go there. It's archive.org. Uh, they have, they're digitizing a lot of their books in this collection, but these are books from all over the world. They've had to, to write and, and uh, collect books from Ireland to put in their collection. So if there's something here you can't find, 
Internet Archive is a really good place to go to see if there's some books that might be missing here that you can get online for free. It's a really great website. We've got handouts. It's, it's fun. So uh, my beautiful home state of Michigan. I was just teasing Lawrence a little bit earlier that you have to go. Um, Michigan needs your money. <laughs> uh, we're in a tough financial strait right now. But the Irish immigration to, the, to Michigan are basically for two things, railroad work, lumber work, and mining work. Uh, there's also a lot of auto industry after 1900, Henry Ford being the big one um, and the Dodge brothers being another one. So you could make, uh, there's a lot of different uh, big pushes in the labor movement in Michigan as well uh, with the Flint sit, sit down strike during the twenties uh, with the mining strike up in the Keweenaw Peninsula up in uh, Northern Michigan. So the Irish were a huge, uh, huge influence in the organization of labor. And it's one of the, the things that small children are taught in school. When you talk about Michigan history, you talk about big labor movements. And one of those are from our, our what our Irish immigrants helped to organize those labor unions. So I looked and said that um, if anybody's really, really interested in learning more about mining and mining records, there were extensive iron ore mining records for Irish immigrants kept in Michigan. And they're held by the Department of Natural Resources up here in the Keweenaw Peninsula all the way up here they are not online they are not online they are not indexed but if you would like to see they have but they have full notes agitators no offense they're all called agitators i don't know why they're just labor unionizers like i have no, anyway but they'll have full dossiers of people they'll have full uh, information about their home life they kept letters uh they went through people's mail uh, it's it's really kind of interesting stuff. The state of Michigan has no money to digitize these, no way to make these available. But again, that's that whole, we're keeping track of you through your relatives in Ireland. So if you're getting any news coming in from them, we're going to go track that down too. Um, so it, it's a really interesting angle uh, when you're looking at records from Michigan. Um, but apart from that, there's, there's so much to do with shipping, a lot of shipping work as well, a lot of... Um, ships going from again wisconsin coming through the great lakes so we actually have several coast guard schools and several mariner merchant marine schools and things like that in michigan coast guard schools all of that in a bag of crisps because michigan you're never more than 88 miles away from water from any one of the great lakes no matter where you are in the state that's just a blessing that we have so uh ohio the one state that has no giant emblem in the middle i, I love this i love ohio ohio is a fantastic place it was one of the earliest states for settlement uh, from westward migrating Irish immigrants who are coming in. Now, this is pr way pre-famine. Um, so people are funneling into the state starting after the Revolutionary War. We had acquired this land in a treaty with the Native Americans. So uh, uh, Irish immigrants who had come to some of the early colonial states, especially Pennsylvania, are moving into Ohio because it's just free land. Go get it. Have fun with it. And they're moving in and they're settling really great lumber, really great uh, farming. And then, of course, you've got the shipping up on, on the top of the coast. Now, there was a huge canal that came through the Ohio and Erie Canal and the Miami and Erie Canal, which were both giant canal building projects that took place from about 1830 uh, till about 1845. And those uh, not terribly well paid. Um, but it was enough that people could were writing friends and saying like, hey, come to Ohio, we got jobs, we got tons of jobs. They had more jobs than what they had people for. Um, and then of course, when they got through uh, building the canals, building the railroads that went through, um, then they, of course, then they had a huge boom in their uh, industries for making all sorts of factory goods. And then they're shipping them out through Cleveland, which was a huge settlement for uh, Irish immigrants in Cleveland. And they were shipping those out to the Great Lakes and, of course, into the Atlantic. So Cleveland was a huge boon. Um, of course, it's gone recently gone through some really horrible, uh, 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 dire economic times, but it's really started to re reboom. And if you have anybody interested in doing uh, Ohio State research, this is a great state to do research. Nearly everything's online for free. If um, you can request stuff from counties, they'll give it to you for free. They're one of the best, most helpful states that you will ever work with. I can't advocate the state enough, and they've done a lot to preserve a lot of their um, Irish historical sites and a lot of the smaller communities. Um, they haven't bulldozed through them and have made them into like giant interstates and stuff like that. They've done a really good job of that. 
Um, the last two states that I'm going to talk very briefly about are going to be Pennsylvania and New York. Now, they're the two smallest, I'm going to say smallest, Pennsylvania especially, there's like one tiny little part of Pennsylvania uh, that touches the Great Lakes. But this was a big, big one for the Irish immigrants who are coming through, uh, who are settling with William Penn. And, and this is something that Tina and I have looked at every once in a while when uh, we've had patrons that we've helped at our libraries, um, where uh, William Penn opened a lot of settlement to Irish immigrants um, to use as a buffer <laughs> for his Quaker settlers uh, to keep the Native Americans occupied uh, while he's building this the city of brotherly love. Now, now people will joke about it, but it's completely he did the same thing with the Germans. So I'm just saying that he's using a lot of different ethnic groups to buffer his city of Pennsylvania, I'm sorry, Philadelphia. So it, whether it was intentional or it was just basically to give people free farmland, I'm, I'm not going to make a decision of that right now. Um, we just say, thank you very much. Thank you for the free, awesome land. Uh, Pennsylvania has very good records. So we, um, we were looking at Pennsylvania and saying, as people are moving up uh, through Pennsylvania into Ohio, because remember, Pennsylvania is right next to Ohio. So they're settling in Pennsylvania. They're get, as soon as the Revolutionary War is over, it's the free land time, let's go to Ohio. They start moving into Ohio. And that's where we start getting some of those, that early migration into the Western parts of the United States. But basically, because Pennsylvania was such a hotbed, huge, huge Irish communities, a lot of them very rural, but they were farming folk. Um, so this is where we kind of say it's our first big wave of our Irish immigrants. Uh, that we can kind of put our finger on because William Penn did kind of keep them in one specific spot, um, one specific area. Um, and then of course, New York. I'm not gonna talk anything about New York City. New York is a jigsaw puzzle. Where half of their, if we looked at their records the way we look at a jigsaw puzzle, that half of them are gone. The other half have been, nobody knows where they are. There's another portion that can't be accessed because of incompetency. And then uh, there's another portion of people who just don't care and won't give you those records. And you have to send them a $20 bribe to get them. I've had to do that two or three times. So I'm not gonna talk too much about New York records as it is, but of the large city that's really part of this whole metropolis of, on the water, uh, which is Buffalo. Buffalo had a very sizable, respectable, trades and uh, trade uh, trade class and uh, working class Irish area in Buffalo. Um, it's going through a renaissance. So if anybody's interested in going to see either buy a really cheap American property or to go just see some of the original structures and original buildings to these Irish neighborhoods, um, Buffalo has, has a big arts and historic preservation uh, movement right now. So it's a good time to go and take a look and see what they've managed to preserve. But Buffalo is a huge shipping and brewery industry. And I always am very, very mindful that people are getting to um, through the Erie Canal. They're doing a lot of different canal work and some, some other sort of light industry. Um, but the upper reaches of New York are farmland. It's some of the most beautiful, picturesque farmland you'll ever see. And a, some of the people who are living up in these areas near the lake um, have Irish ancestry. And they've actually named some of the uh, wineries that have taken over from being, you know, just regular crops. There's a huge wine and winery industry now. And some of those families can trace their ancestry to those Irish immigrants who came up, who didn't stay in New York City, who came up uh, to, to uh, who came up through uh, the, the river systems, through the canal systems to come up into the Great Lakes. And uh, they're, they're sitting on some of the most beautiful uh, wineries uh, on, on lake property that you'll ever see. Um, so they've made out really, really well. Um, apart from some of that, there's some, a couple other industries which are still masonry and, co and coal mining. Um, but, you know, I think for the most part, once you kind of get there, you kind of see it, you see it's a really heavy industry and, and a farming sort of community, but you know, it is what it is. So apart from that, um, I kind of, told Tina that I would keep it to 20 minutes, which have I kept it to 20 minutes? You are right on time. <laughs> yes. I'm yeah, she did. Bodily harm. It was horrible. Um, so I'm hoping that at least that gave you all a very good overview very quickly of a very large geographical area that all of you should come see. 
All of you should definitely come take advantage of free records if you or if you're interested in set, set, sending people our way. Um, and definitely come see some of the Irish neighborhoods and some of the Irish areas um, of the Great Lakes region because you won't ever regret it. it. Some of it will not always be clean. Some of it will be very dirty and kind of gross and, and not always uh, pretty. Uh, but it is, um, it's a really, really excellent place to come and take a look and see how people came and settled in a really beautiful area of the, of the United States. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to let Miss Tina come up here and do her amazing thing. Sure, you, know, uh, you know what I mean. You are Chicago Irish. Yes. Since we each only had 20 minutes, that's why I had to threaten her because <coughs> she'd still be talking at three and you oh. would all be very hungry. Oh. So while Deb didn't go into tremendous detail about Illinois, in 20 minutes, I can't go into tremendous detail either, but I'm going to tell you a couple stories and talk about a couple neighborhoods. How many of you have been to Chicago? How many of you have ventured outside of downtown to some of the Irish communities? Bridgeport, Back of the Yards, Gage Park, Brighton Park, Canaryville. See, none of you come visit us. I will tell you, I am very proud of my heritage. I am fifth generation Chicago Irish. We have our own song called the South Side Irish Song. You know that I will not torture you by singing, but we are very proud of our heritage. Now, for those of you who have been to Chicago, you can easily find it on a map. But for those of you who haven't, we are also on Lake Michigan that Deb pointed out earlier. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea of where we are in relation to the rest of the country. Now, Deb mentioned New York. And a lot of people have this misconception that Irish only came in through the port of New York. Now, it's absolutely not true. A lot of them came in through Boston. We had seven ports along the eastern seaboard. Some of them even came in through Canada and traveled down, either through the Great Lakes, through Vermont, which was a very large crossover. Um, so not everybody came through New York. So when people can't find their ancestors, they think, oh, well, you know, they must have, you know, stolen or cheated their way in. There was a huge number of people who came in through Philadelphia and who came in through Boston. So Deb kind of mentioned earlier about those lost Irish, those lost relatives. Um, the Boston Globe had a column where people could write in and ask, have you seen, you know, Mary Sullivan? She supposedly arrived on, you know, May 4th. She hasn't been heard from. If anybody sees her, please contact us in Atlanta, Georgia, San Francisco, California, Chicago, Illinois. So the Boston Globe was really the paper where people sent in those lost, lost relatives columns. So, you know, and Boston's really not that close. You know, you're talking a couple hours away from New York, so it's still quite a distance. So in Chicagoland, um, the Irish had a tendency to settle on the south side. That's where my family is from. So here's downtown right here. So for you who have gone and seen State Street and have visited, you know, the Sears, Sears Tower and you've gone to the art museums, you're right in the center of this huge city. Chicagoland actually spreads into Indiana. It spreads up north into Wisconsin. It is a huge community. The Chicago land area, which is what we call it, it's Chicago land. It's not just the city of Chicago. We have over 8 million people, you know, so it is a huge population. Um, and over a quarter of them, you know, we trace our ancestry back to Ireland. So just to give you a brief overview about how Chicago came about, I'm not going to talk about it for long, but it came out of Fort Dearborn and Fort Dearborn was really set up after the War of 1812 to kind of protect settlers and protect waterways between Detroit, where Deb's family was from, and Chicago, Illinois. So the fort was very instrumental in protecting settlers across all of Northern Illinois during the Black Hawk War, which was a very short skirmish uh, with the local Indian tribes in 1832. So it was decommissioned in 1837, but parts of it lingered on for a number of years. People were using the buildings. They were, you know, store, using them as storehouses and other facilities, even though it wasn't a fort any longer. Um, but the, the last remnants of the fort were destroyed in the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. So how many of you have heard about the Great Chicago Fire? And the fact that, you know, the urban legend is it was started by Mrs. O'Leary's cow who lived on DeCoven Street, you know, on the south end of the city. Nobody really knows for sure how the fire started, but they blamed the Irish because it was very easy to blame the Irish because there were so many of us in Chicago in 1871. So Fort Dearborn, for any of you who have been to Chicago, Fort Dearborn is really the center of the city now. 
There's a little landmark on the ground right at State Street with the bridge that crosses over the river. If any of you have seen Tribune Tower or the um, Wrigley Building, they sit right on those corners. That's where the original Fort Dearborn was on the south end of the road. So you, it's hard to see from this map, but State Street where it crosses the river right there, right in downtown, right in the heart of Chicago is where Fort Dearborn was. As the city grew, here's the fire. So you could see in red, all of the districts of the city that were destroyed by the fire. Luckily it didn't reach Bridgeport. So the Irish neighborhoods were right along here. So we were saved. We were saved from the fire. And a lot of it was still empty at the time. I have maps um, for the platting of Bridgeport um, in the 1850s when they opened up the eastern side of, of Bridgeport towards uh, what would now be the expressway, which would be um, I-90 now, um, kind of where Comiskey Park is, which I'll talk about at the end. Um, so we were largely spared by any fire damage. So a lot of Irish came to Chicago to work on the i &M Canal. They had originally worked on the Erie Canal in the 1820s. When that was finished, they started moving towards Chicago to find work. Now, the i &M Canal in Illinois has a long and sordid history because in the 1820s, they decided they wanted to do the same thing and they wanted to have a canal to connect people to the Mississippi River, but they couldn't get the financing they would start and then they would go bankrupt. And then they would hire new commissioners who would siphon off the funds that were supposed to be used for the, um, the surveying of the land. So then they would go bankrupt again and they would have to wait. So there were lots of periods where there would be work and then no work. So there were lots of Irish immigrants who would come to work on the canals and they would start digging. And then three months later they would go broke and they would all be laid off work and they would have to wait until money came in again so they could start working and digging on the canal again. So there were lots of periods where they just had nothing to do. And you can imagine when you have a large number of single men with nothing better to do, there would be lots of problems and fights and you know things that would go on. So there was a lot of carousing that went on during the canal building. Um, so the very first lock for the canal was built at Bridgeport. And that's where our neighborhood gets its name. It's because it was a bridge that would help people ford the river. So when they put that in, that's how the city, that's how our neighborhood got its name. So the canal route ran from Bridgeport all the way down to Peru, Illinois, where it would connect with the Illinois River. So as I said, the canal ebbed and flowed for a number of years, but it didn't actually open to the public until 1848. Um, so there are records associated with the canal and the vast majority of them are in Springfield, Illinois in the capital. But there are records on the i &M Canal that you can find in each of the communities. So in Will County, they're in the city of Joliet, which is the county seat, and in Lockport, Illinois, which is um, part of the, the canal um, route, there's a lot of records there. There were a lot of parishes that opened along the way to cater to the Irish who were coming in for the canal. St. Dennis's Parish in Lockport was all Irish, and it was just south of Lockport because they sold land as scrip. So you didn't get paid. It was here, we're gonna give you this piece of property as your wages because we can't afford to pay you money. And a lot of times those scripts were treated like cash. If you lost it, you're out of luck. You could trade it, you could sell it, you could give it away, you could keep it and build on it. It was yours to do with what you wanted, but they're not registered. So if you lost it, there wasn't some way to go and get a new one. It was just gone. So those records exist for Lockport. So there's a way to trace those Irish who stayed in the Lockport area. But as far as I know, they don't exist for some of the other communities. But Ottawa, Illinois, which is right near where the end of the canal is um, in LaSalle County, their local genealogical guild has a lot of records for the Irish who worked on the canal that stayed in the Ottawa area. So there are some places to go to look for those records as well. So Lockport, or, uh, the first lock was in Bridgeport right at the top of the map and you can kind of see that dark black line how it tra trains its way down across the landscape until it finally ends in Peru and connects with the river. So any of those canal towns, whether it's Lockport, whether it's Joliet, whether it's Ottawa, are going to have information on your Irish ancestors. The railroads are a uh, post-Civil War phenomenon. So for those of you who have been to the United States, 
the Civil War, the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War was this year. So from 1861 to 1865, the United States was in complete and utter turmoil. You know, they were fighting each other for a number of reasons. The country was divided between North and South and immigration plummeted during those years because what the Union government in the North was doing is it was grabbing people right off the ships, handing them a gun, and sending them to fight at the front for the Union Army. So the immigration totals in those four years dropped dramatically. So if you had immigrants who came in during that time period and they were young men, it's very possible that they were conscripted and, and, and served usually six months. So I found some of my Scots who came in at that point who got off the ship in New York, were handed a gun and sent to the front for six months. You know, and then they were allowed to go on with with their their lives after that. So, you know, it's very possible if you had relatives who came in during that time period that that's what happened to them. So in Chicago, you know, post Civil War 1865, what's called the Union Stockyards opened and it was a huge industrial railroad complex made up of factories and rail yards and um, stockyards is exactly what it was. So they were bringing in cattle from all over the United States and Canada. They were funneling them through Chicago and then processing them, whether they were shipping the cattle whole to another place, whether they were you know, cutting them up and selling them to meat markets and things like that, or processing the remainders of the animals into you know, fats and Crisco's and, and, and products like petroleum. All of that was funneling through Chicago. So because of the stockyards opening in 1865, you see a lot of communities that ring the stockyards growing exponentially at this time. So Bridgeport was relatively safe because it was earlier than that. But Canaryville and back of the yards are the two biggest populations in neighborhoods that surrounded the yards where a lot of poor immigrant Irish who would work for cheap wages would come and find jobs. So meat packing, canning factories, bottlers, other types of manufacturers all needed that labor. So they were paying them just pennies on the dollar for what they were worth so they could get those products shipped all over the United States. So not only were they working in the yards, you know, they were working as cabooseman, they were working as stokers for the fires, for the, the train cars, they were loaders. It was a very dangerous job to work for the railroads in, in the yards, in the rail yards. You had a lot of men who suffered injury and death. They would get crushed between two cars. They would fall off of cars. There were a lot of injuries that happened. So my family splits the famine. So my one side of my family came to Bridgeport before to work. They were, they were masons, they were stone masons and, and bricklayers. So they arrived to work on the canal. And then the other half of my family came after the famine. I have no famine Irish that I know of in my family, but they came and worked for the railroads because that was the big industry. Post famine was railroads, pre famine it was canal work. So I had my great grandpa Pete, who sadly was a notorious drunk and my mom tells me all the time about stories, you know, regales me with stories of my great grandpa Pete, who I was supposed to be named after. And one, at one instance, there was a newspaper article about my great grandpa Pete. He was a cabooseman. So his job was to hang off the back of the railroad cars with his lantern so that he could alert the, the switchmen and the other railroad workers that there was a train coming in. Well, he was notoriously drunk one night and actually fell off the caboose and broke his leg and his arm because he just rolled right off. And they just left him and came back for him later. So he laid there for a number of hours. Um, but it was very dangerous work. And they had a lot of downtime. So when they were off of work, they would go to the hundreds of bars that, that would ring around the railway yards and the stockyards. My family were certainly not saints, that's for sure. So like I said, a huge number of Irish laborers arrived during and after the famine. You know, they arrived in, in Irish neighborhoods like Hamburg, Brighton Park, Canaryville, back of the yards. Um, typically when Bridgeport, and I'll talk about this in a couple of slides, Bridgeport were largely Ulster. Everybody else was a Republic of Ireland. So because the Irish workers were already living in some of these areas in 1865 when the stockyards opened, they were the first people to get work because they were already within the neighborhood. After 1865, a lot of other immigrant groups started filling into these neighborhoods. Um, so as the other immigrant groups are moving in, a lot of those Irish are moving out. They didn't like the rabble 
that was coming in, you know, and diluting their Irish neighborhoods. So like I said, I grew up in Bridgeport, which is at the top of the map. You see the canal kind of cutting across the upper left-hand portion where it says new city. This section right here, that is the neighborhoods of the back of the yards in Canaryville. And it was originally called Canaryville because supposedly there was a sizable canary population there. Um, and they would feed off of the pickings, you know, in the meat yards, you know, in the, the meat plants and the factories, you know, they would kind of pick up what was left in the stockyard after they fed the cattle. So they were coming and eating what was left over. Um, back of the yards, you can imagine where that name comes from. They were behind the stockyards. So Brighton Park, Gage Park, and then into the 20th century, you know, Woodlawn, Chicago Lawn, West Lawn is where all those Irish started to go. So Canaryville still to this day is a very hard scrabble, rough and tumble Irish neighborhood. There's been a large influx of Hispanics into Canaryville over the years, um, but there's still this very steadfast Irish core who doesn't like being infiltrated by other groups. Um, but because of uh, how tight-knit this community was. St. Gabriel's Parish was really the center of this community. Everything went through St. Gabe's. You know, it had its own parochial school that is still an active school today. It still is um, a very popular choice for Catholic um, grade school, for parochial school. Um, but these people who lived in Canaryville, as their economic status began to rise, they started moving south into those neighborhoods that I mentioned. Um, Beverly has a humongous Southside Irish parade every year that is actually bigger in some years than the um, main, the, the city-sponsored um, St. Patrick's Day parade. If you guys have been to Chicago during that time, they talk about dying the river green. If you've ever been to Chicago, the river's pretty much green anyway, so you can't really tell much of a difference. Um, but new communities, what they call new Irish communities, like Beverly, Morgan Park, and Oak Lawn are 20th century Irish populations. Those people who wanted bigger yards, they wanted more space, they were sick of living on top of each other, moved south into those neighborhoods. So the Union Stockyards, here's a couple photos of what it looked like. The Union Stockyards were an entire square mile. You know, so for us, it would be 460 acres. I'm not sure what it would be in hectares or, or something like that, but it was an entire square mile for us. I mean, that is a very large space. They would have hundreds of thousands of cattle that would move through every month. So you can imagine that it might not have smelled the, the, the best. It might not have been the most pleasant of environments to work in. And even into the 1950s, my mom tells stories about how badly the neighborhood smelled. You know, so I'm kind of delighted now at my age that it doesn't smell like that anymore. But because of all the meatpacking plants, you know, there was a lot of waste. And what they would do is because they were right in between the canal and the Chicago River, is they would take that waste and they would dump it into the canal and the river. So the Chicago River at one time was called Bubbly Creek because they would dump so much waste in it that it would actually bubble from the carbon, uh, the uh, carbonic acid as it would break down, as the animal flesh would break down, and the river would catch on fire multiple times a year. So it is still largely untouchable. You would never want to swim in it or put your toe in it for any reason. So they've been trying to really clean up the river over the last couple of decades. They put a nature preserve there, right uh, where the mouth of the, the canal and the river meet, um, right off of uh, Damon Avenue. And you can go and you can bird watch, but they, there's like a sign every six feet, don't touch the water. Do not touch the water. Don't go near the water. Luckily, it doesn't catch on fire anymore, but it was really where they just threw everything. They were hoping that it was going to float downstream, but with all the fats and the oils and the grease and, and, and the chemicals, it just stayed there. So it looked literally like, um, like, yeah, like chicken fat, you know, when it dries and chicken fat kind of turns white and it's kind of jiggly like jello. You could literally watch birds and animals walk across it. It was so, because it never went anywhere. It was so heavy, it just stayed, stayed right in that spot. It was really, really kind of gross. Um, the back of the yards neighborhood was also a very rough neighborhood. Um, when I was a teenager growing up, there used to be a bar that we used to go to. Not that I ever drank underage. I never did that. Um, but there was a bar that was called Mickey's that we used to go to. And we were on our way home one night, and an officer pulled us over and said, what are you doing here? Nothing. We're not doing anything here. We're on our way home. And he said, do not stop. Don't stop at red lights. Don't stop at stop signs. Just keep going until you're back to Bridgeport. 
that's how rough of a neighborhood it was. They didn't want us, you know, cute little girls, you know, getting stopped or attacked by somebody in, in the back of the arts neighborhood. It is really a very, very dangerous neighborhood today. So it was a very mixed neighborhood also. It had a lot of Lithuanians, it had a lot of Polish, it had a lot of Eastern Europeans who came to work in the meatpacking factories. Have any of you ever heard of the book, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair? It's a very famous book in the States and it, it's a whole book that Upton Sinclair wrote about what life was like living in Canaryville and back of the yards and what it was like working for the meat packing in the stockyards during you know, the 1900s. It's written in 1906. And I'm gonna pass it around so you guys could take a look at it. You should be able to find it online for free. You can download a free copy of it either through the Gutenberg Project or, or Google Books or another type of online uh, bookseller. But it's really worth a read. So if you had family that you've heard of that came to Chicago and worked, you know, or lived in back of the yards, it really gives you a horrifying example of how hard and how rough life was. They would work 12, 15 hour days. You know, they would get paid pennies. In turn, they would have to pay dollars for their rent. You know, you would have 15, 12 to 15 people living in a single room apartment all together. You know, they would sleep in shifts. You know, you'd have six mattresses, so only six people could sleep at a time and you'd have to rotate. It was a very, very hard life to work for the stockyards in 1900. So it's definitely worth taking a look at the jungle to give you just a small idea of what life was like to live in, in these two neighborhoods at that time. So one of our local papers, which was called the Chicago Inner Ocean, um, it was actually founded by Scots. It was founded by Thomas McMillan and it catered to Chicago Europeans. It was for people who was, they were not native to Illinois um, and it would spend a lot of time talking about what was going on in Europe and it would focus on the different countries so that anybody, whether you were German or Irish or Italian, could get some little snippet of what life was like at home. So they, they wrote this little story here about the telegraph boy, about how he was going between the buildings of the inner ocean and about how his clothes were so saturated with the filth and grime and smell passing through Bridgeport that the, he wrote a whole song about it. So I don't know if you could see it, you know, but uh, where the odors of heaven give, you know, place to hell, where the bone boilers curse is a devilish yell. So he wrote out this whole little ditty on his way back because of the smell of Bridgeport. Like I said, when the stockyards opened in 1865, the population of Bridgeport started to change. It started moving away from those Ulster Irish of Cavan and Derry and started bringing in people from the Republic. So they talk about in Bridgeport and Brighton about how, it's, how it feels like old Ireland, how Tipperary and Limerick and Sligo and Bantry all met here, you know, to feel a little piece of of their, their countryside, you know, and they talk about the, you know, stand smoking at the door and Irish women with a dozen or more babies, you know, crawling around and they talk about dogs and, you know, humorous pluck of the Irish. So it's a great little story that was written in 1865 in the Chicago Republican. Now here's my neighborhood. So I'm very proud to be from, from Bridgeport. Bridgeport is one of those, it's an early neighborhood and it's the earliest Irish neighborhood, but what Bridgeport is known for is its ties to Chicago politics. So we are very proud of our Chicago mayors of, from Bridgeport. We had five mayors, four of them were Bridgeport Irish from Bridgeport. There was only one who was mayor who was not actually Irish um, and that was Mayor Balanbeck and nobody liked him. So Bridgeport was largely stonemasons and um, Bricklayers, that's how my family came. So Deb talked about the Irish coming into New York and then moving on. My Irish came to New York and they went to Albany because there was a huge population of Irish in Albany in the 1830s and 40s. And from that population in Albany, three out of four branches of my family all came to Chicago from Albany. Two of them were stonemasons, three of them were bricklayers. And they came to Chicago to build the canal and to build churches. Because after the canal finished in 1848, they needed to put their skills to work. So they started building a lot of those Irish parishes in and around Chicago. So the first one built was St. Bridget's, which was 1854. Before that, before St. Bridget's was built, there was what was called Old St. Patrick's Church and it was in the heart of downtown Chicago now. And that was the parish for the entire city. So even if you lived on the West or in the North or in the South, all of the baptismal records for early Chicago pre-1854 are at Old St. Pat's. 
And those are digitized and they're online on the Family Search website. And we've got a handout at the back that'll talk about that. So it wasn't until the 1840s and 1850s that other churches started to be built to start finding those records. So for Bridgeports, it was St. Bridget's. And then my parish church, was, which was Nativity of Our Lord Parish. So St. Bridget's was right next to the canal. As Bridgeport grew and more and more people moved in and filled in the neighborhood, they built a church on the eastern end of the neighborhood because it grew out from the canal. So Nativity of Our Lord Parish was built originally in 1868. It was destroyed by fire three years later. And then they built the second church, um, which was started in 1873 and then uh, finished in 1876. So my great grandfather, Patrick Clark, who is from Cabin, who is who we have been, I have been researching since we got here. There's a story that there was a beer, what was called the beer pail strike. And it was all started because of my great grandpa, Patrick. So they used to be given a pail of beer for all of them to share over lunch while they were working on constructing the church. So every day they were given a half hour for lunch. The priest would bring out a pail of beer for all of the men to share. Well, my great grand great great grandfather Patrick decided he didn't want to share the beer. He thought that they deserved more. So he decided to rally the troops, so to speak, and they all went on strike for more beer. Well, the parish priest was having none of that. So he decided to eliminate the beer altogether and said, well, if you want more, I'm giving you none at all. So there was this, this back and forth for a couple of weeks where no work was done on the church because they were fighting over whether they were getting more beer or no beer. So eventually they settled to their one pail of beer and they continued to work and finished the church in 1876. So, so I mentioned my great grandpa Pete, it was his father, Patrick. So apparently that kept getting handed down from generation to generation. So like I said, largely we started from Cabin and Derry, but after 1865, we started getting those people from Tipperary, Waterford, Kerry, all over the Republic of Ireland. So Waterford plays an important part in, in Bridgeport's history, and that's gonna be the next slide. So here's Nativity of Our Lord Church. Here's my church where I was baptized. In Chicago, as Bridgeport was already above everybody else, because we were skilled laborers. We were masons, you know, we were iron workers, we were bricklayers. So we already had a step up for, from those Irish who were working in the back of the yards in Canaryville who were unskilled laborers. So we already had kind of a step up towards greatness, so to speak. So in Chicago, as more and more Irish politicians were getting elected to office, Bridgeport kind of rose with that population. So if you've ever heard the term patronage jobs, Basically, that starts in Bridgeport. We've also invented dibs, too. That's, that's a Bridgeport thing. Um, so what would happen is an Irish politician would get elected to office, and then he would fill all of his positions with his cousins and his brother and his neighbor down the street. So you, know, you might need a secretary. You might need a driver. You might need you know, a postman. And patronage jobs were those, those coattail jobs where you were hiring your family to work for you and giving them really high wages because this, the city was paying for your staff. So most of the people who worked in Chicago were Irish from Bridgeport because they had so many people that they were filling into those positions that, you know, Bridgeport was pretty well healed. It was a, a pretty um, well to do Irish neighborhood. Almost every fire department, almost every police station in the city of Chicago is still run by Irishmen. They're not all from Bridgeport, a lot of them are, but every single one of them has their, either their chief, you know, or their second in command is a Chicago Irishman. So I mentioned our four mayors. We had Edward Kelly, Martin Keneally, Richard J. Daly, and Richard M. Daly, who are probably the two most famous because they're the most recent um, Chicago Irish mayors. Richard J. Daly was a piece of work, let me tell you. I picked this photo because I, thought it made him look pretty stupid. And well, in fact, he actually was pretty stupid. But Richard Jay Daly, Daly was an only child. He was a very arrogant man, but he was a very powerful man. And he was probably the most powerful of all of the Chicago mayors ever in the city of Chicago. So when the city of Chicago was looking to build and construct the interstates, so I-90 was actually moved because they originally had the plan to come right through the heart of Bridgeport and Mayor Daley fought that and had it moved four blocks over to run where it is now, right next to what uh, used to be called Comiskey Park, because that was the border line between Bridgeport, the, the Irish neighborhood, and the projects in the black neighborhood. And Richard J. Daley was very famous for saying, I don't want those people in my neighborhood. So he constructed this huge highway 
to divide the two classes of people so they wouldn't come into Bridgeport. So his mother Lillian was very influential in his early life. You know, it made him very sensitive to women's rights, not a whole lot of other rights, but made him very sensitive to women's rights and fair labor laws, as long as they were Irish labor. So the Daly's were very staunch supporters in the Nativity Church. I was about this tall when Mayor Daly died, and I remember standing in the snow for hours. The line for his funeral stretched for blocks because he grew up in the neighborhood and we all lived in the neighborhood and he took very, very good care of Bridgeport. You know, he made sure that we were protected, that we always had paved streets, that we always had clean streets, that we were always protected by police and fire. He really went out of his way to protect his, his home neighborhood. Now his son, Richard M. Daly, who is no longer mayor, he, he resigned a few years ago. Um, they were the two longest serving mayors in Chicago history. Um, Mayor Daly goes on the public speaking circuit now. He moved out of the neighborhood and it was a very huge deal for him to move out and leave us all behind, so to speak. So some people don't think so highly of Richie. Some of us do. My mom tells stories about they went to private school and about how their driver would drive down the street and all of my mom's sisters, they'd throw rocks at the car as it drove by. They thought they were snotty. Um, but the Dailies are, they're still Dailies in Bridgeport. There's actually uh, Patrick Daly, who is the nephew um, of Richard M. Daly, who's running for alderman now. So they've been there a long, long time. Another fam famous Bridgeport person is Charles Comiskey. Have any of you gone to a White Sox game or have gone to, to Comiskey Park, right? Growing up in Bridgeport, I told this story a little earlier. When you grow up in Bridgeport, you are three things. You are Irish. You are Democratic and you are a Sox fan. And if you are not all three of those things, you do not live in Bridgeport. We don't have Cubs fans in Bridgeport. We run them out as quickly as we can. Um, but Charles Comiskey was a larger than life baseball player. All he wanted to do since he was a little boy was play baseball. Well, his father, John, who you see in the smaller, the smaller image there, was a very loved alderman. You know, he was one of those people that was honest and trustworthy and people would come to him, but he was also um, very steadfast and hardworking, and he thought this frivolous game of baseball shouldn't even be played by kids. He wanted his boys to spend their time, you know, doing industrious work. Well, their mother had the complete opposite notion. So she would, was known around the neighborhood to sneak out the back door and play with the kids in the alley and, and throw balls to them so they could play baseball. So she really fed this love of the game to, to Charles Comiskey. And he made his, his money and he made his fame in St. Louis, the St. Louis Browns was a team that he managed and played for in the 1880s. So when he came back to Chicago, he wanted to start a baseball team here. So he was really very influential in starting the American Baseball League um, and starting the Chicago White Stockings as they were called at the time. Um, he was also extremely generous. Whenever somebody asked him for something, he was there with a hand, whether it was the Red Cross or the Salvation Army. During the First World War, he gave a lot of money to returning soldiers to help with um, clothing expenses and war wounds and, and helping mothers who had lost sons. So he was really a very generous man. But probably the number one thing that I love him for most is our Chicago White Sox. So I am very proud to be a Sox fan. I'm very proud to be from Bridgeport. Um, and we have some very important and influential people, including Charles Comiskey, whose nickname was Kami. So I was telling Deb the other day, I said, oh, you know, we." You know, we need to pay our respects to Kami Comiskey. And she says, Kami. I said, yeah, C-O-M-M-Y, not C-O-M-M-I-E. I said, he wasn't a fan of Lenin. He was, you know. So the, the Comiskey family actually is from Baileyboro Cabin as well, which is where my family is from. Um, so we were going through valuation roles um, in Dublin a few days ago. And I nudged Deb and I said, look, here's a Comiskey. So they were right in the neighborhood then, just like they're right in the neighborhood now. So Deb and I are open for any questions. There's a handout that they printed for you. So all of the resources that I talked about, so when I talked about back of the yards, when I talked about railroads or for the canals, there's a list of websites on the handout. So if you have family who did one of these jobs, all of those sites are listed. All of the repositories that have Chicago Irish records are listed on that list as well. So instead of wasting our time, my time giving you websites here, you can do all of your research off of the list that we gave you. And we have cards if you have any further questions. Yeah, your, your book is like in the fourth row. That's okay. Finish looking at the book. You should really read it because it's a very well-read, well-written book to begin with. And it's free. It is free and we're right on time. We are. I hope so. Thank you.
Were you all adequately entertained? Yes. Or would you guys come back if we came back here to lecture again? Would you all bring like 20 of your friends? No, I think if you come to Chicago, you need to let me give you the Chicago Irish tour. Yeah. So next time you're in Chicago, you need to let me show you around. I'd be happy to do so. <laughs> yeah. I'll even get a big car. And I'll drive. Is that all? No questions? You guys are just want to go home, have tea? Okay, well, thanks, guys, for coming. Go get your handouts. Have fun. Come talk to us if you're not shy. You know, if there's a shy thing. That's cool. All right, thank you. Um, how many people did we have? There we go. That's all.